What are the security threats facing the United States? General Stephen Cheney, CEO of the American Security Project, has a list of the worst ones. He'll discuss them next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. In the aftermath of terrorist attacks, Americans are naturally more concerned about national security. General Stephen Cheney, CEO of the American Security Project, spends his days keeping track of threats to the nation. Welcome to the show, General Cheney. Well, Dr. Bercia, I'm so glad to be back. Tell us about your motivations. You've been involved in the defense of the country in various ways as a Marine now working with the American Security Project. What, what keeps you going? You know, it, it's interesting. When you come up as a junior Marine, a junior officer through the ranks, at the early stages, you're interested in the tactical situation. The more senior you get, the more educated you get, more involved you get. And you begin to realize that there's a much bigger picture here that you're somewhat a part of. And I think I go back pretty much to the time that I was assigned to the Office of the Secretary of Defense and I uh, got up, uh, nominated to be the Deputy Executive Secretary to then Dick Cheney, no relation. And we sat down and chatted and went over the family tree, no relation. Uh, but it was there I got pretty good exposure to what was going on in the world and actually sat next to him, for instance, when our troops went into Somalia, watched it on TV, interpreted for him what the vehicles were. And from there, I got nominated to be a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And that really uh, spurred my interest in the relationship between the defense establishment, NASA security, and the security of our country, and international relations. And I have followed that through ever since, culminating, of course, today with my involvement with the American Security Project. So uh, uh, that part of it has is, is stuck with me. I've been very much involved. And, and I think most of your senior military folks, particularly the flag officers, uh, understand the national strategy and, and want to stay involved. Tell us about your early days as a Marine. What, what were your challenges and what were your opportunities? Well, I, you know, when you're, when you're right out of, for my case, right out of the Naval Academy and you go to what the Marines call basic school, you get signed an occupational specialty, artillery in my case, and then you go out to your unit. My first unit was at Camp Pendleton. It was an artillery battery. Um, like I said, you're focused on the tactical situation. But here's an interesting point. Uh, we transitioned from what was called the 105 howitzer to the 155 millimeter howitzer. The 155 at that time was nuclear capable. And that, when I think back on that as a young lieutenant and captain, to have that massive amount of power literally in your hands. You went to a school and were taught how to build that round and then how to plan to shoot it. And, and I just think back on it. I think at that time it was just a tactical situation. It was another weapon in your arsenal. And I, when I think back on it now, what a, tr what a tremendous capability, what a horrendous capability. And it did, you know, it, then I didn't have an appreciation for that perspective on it, the national implications on it. Of course, the Marines now have no nuclear weapons. They're, they're, they don't have any tactical nukes. The whole U.S. arsenal has some limited tactical nukes, but they're pretty much all strategic. But that's another one there that in my early career, I said, wow, this is, this is really something else. And it's pretty exciting, I'll, I will tell you. And I moved from that, flew back seat in OV-10 aircraft, uh, both at Camp Pendleton and in Okinawa and at Camp Lejeune. Uh, really enjoyed that, enjoyed the backseat flying aspect of it. And the more senior you get, the more command opportunities you get. Got involved in boot camp, commanded uh, both at San Diego and at Paris Island. And my last job in the Marine Corps was commanding general at Paris Island, which I think was the best job in the world. Working with, we had 23,000 young men and women come through there a year. Uh, so it's a big operation. What, what's the best part? When they arrive, when they graduate? Oh, boy, the well, experience? Uh, John, <laughs> I don't think they'd say the best part's when they arrive. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it's legendary when you see them get off the bus and the, the eyes screaming at them, which I never much cared for, to be honest with you. And they put them on yellow footprints, but they all know what's coming. They're all, today, they're all volunteers. They're all high school graduates, 99.9% .9 of them. Uh, they're all in shape. I mean, they, they, we have a quality, quality young men and women coming into all the military services today. So, but to answer your question, by far the best part is graduation. And, and if anybody has not been to graduation either at San Diego or at Paris Island, they do 40 or 42 a year, it's open to the public. Uh, they come into a full-fledged parade and a march and there's a speech by the battalion commander, but the best part's the end, where they drop the ropes and in some cases five or 6,000 parents run onto the parade deck to find their young man or woman, and the funny part is, you know, they're all, their heads are shaved, they're all trim, <laughs> a lot of them have lost a lot of weight. 
they don't recognize Johnny. You know? <laughs> and when they do, they're astonished at the transformation, and it literally is a transformation. So moving from that world into the world of policy and sure. uh, research and so forth, uh, how was the transition? Uh, was, it, was it easy? Was it difficult? You know, um, boy, to continue my saga of my career, after being a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City, uh, I was really excited because I was going out to Camp Pendleton to command a, a regimental size unit. And uh, overnight my orders got changed and I got sent to Capitol Hill to work the Congressional uh, Commission on Rules and Missions of the Armed Services. And that, of course, is ultimate policy. Here, here the lawmakers are going to decide the future of all the services. They had a committee, a commission that was going to sit there and make recommendations to the government, to the administration then, and to Congress, and, and could very well have reorganized how everything was going to transpire. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm being a little parochial about this, but we were defending our interests clearly, mm -hmm. the Marine Corps was. And, and at one time, uh, the Air Force wanted to get rid of its close air support mission and give it all. You ready? To the Marine Corps. Marine Corps has its own close air support and is very proud of it. Did not want to absorb the Air Forces either. So, I mean, at that level of policy was pretty interesting to me. And, I, and I've carried that on ever since with my relationship with the Council of Foreign Relations. And then I did some work with John Kerry in 2003, 2004. Uh, I ended up uh, being the chief operating officer of a nonprofit in D.C. as a you know, business executive for National Security was the name of the organization. Um, stayed in touch with Kerry and Hagel. Uh, they formed the American Security Project in 2005. And of course, I know the University of Central Fo uh, Florida is w well involved and understands that because you were involved almost since the inception of ASB, the first uh, university partner that we've ever had. And it's a great relationship. And it stayed with me. And then in 2011, I got called and asked if I would be the CEO of the organization, and then I delightfully took that job. Well, and life has changed a lot in the few years since you took the job. What are the main security concerns facing the United States today? Oh, Lord, uh, John, of course, all you have to do is open the paper any day. And, and of course, now in the heat of an election campaign, all these subjects are really rising to the fore. And I think originally, a lot of your candidates would run on a domestic policy plank. But now, with all the terrorism aspects to it, particularly Paris and San Bernardino, it, uh, uh, it, that is front and center of the headlines. And of course, you would say, I, I, I don't like this term, but if it bleeds, it leads. If it's on the front page and you're killing 14 people in San Bernardino, people are going to read that. And of course, now they're trying to attach it to a religious aspect to it, the Muslim side, which is, which is just terrible. So that, I would say, perhaps is, is topic number one. Now, long term, I'm not sure that's the ultimate threat to the United States. You know, we have been involved with climate change since day one, and people go, oh, yeah, climate change. Yeah, that's, that's not going to kill me tomorrow. No, it won't kill you tomorrow. Mm, but it might kill you in 30 or 40 years if we continue to pollute the atmosphere the way we have. If anybody who's been to Beijing in the last decade can understand, you can't breathe there. I mean, it is just horrible. And the Chinese don't know it. They understand that. But that's where the, the long-term strategic part of security threat comes in. And you've got your deniers, which is incredibly sad in, in my, from my perspective. The science is proven that climate change is here. And there are going to be tremendous threats to our bases and stations here, to many overseas. Diego Garcia will probably go underwater, to many countries. The Marshall Islands will go underwater. Bangladesh, part of that, will go underwater. People don't can't get their hands around the crisis that this is going to cause. Now, we, we know we've got refugee problems because of ISIS and Al Qaeda and Boko Haram throughout Africa and the Middle East. And there are a huge refugee crisis going on with the Syria business, which I think ultimately was caused by Assad, but fueled by the Arab Spring and not handled well by the international community. And that's, of course, now morphed itself into threatening us here as the lone wolf in my opinion, guy from San Bernardino. But the one in Paris was not Lone Wolf. That was coordinated attack by, by ISIS. And that will cause us some severe problems. And there are climate change aspects to the terrorism problem. Oh, Lord, John, the, uh, you know, this is, this is one I can pull the string on almost everything going on. But I'll, I'll start from the beginning with Arab Spring, for instance. They had huge forest fires in the Soviet, in, not Soviet Union, Russia, 2010. Grain production went way down. As a consequence, the price went way up. And grain is bread's made from it. That is a staple diet in the Middle East. Uh, all the prices of food went up, and that helped fuel the instability throughout Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and Syria. Now, in Syria, it was exacerbated because of the phenomenal drought 
2007, 2000, the worst in their history, 2007, 2011. As a consequence, all the farmers, all the agrarian folks moved into the cities, Aleppo and Homs to be specific, and became a huge target for Assad. And of course, when the Arab Spring waved through, of course, the citizens in Syria were not happy with the government. They weren't being treated well. Uh, they they kind of rebelled. It wasn't an armed rebellion initially. It was a peaceful rebellion. Well, Assad made it unpeaceful and attacked them. And his main target, of course, was Aleppo. And here you had several million people there. And he barrel bombed them to death, and literally. And now, of course, you have a phenomenal uh, refugee crisis. So that's the tie in that case between climate change. Now, I'm not saying climate change necessarily caused all that drought, but it was a huge accelerant to the instability. It was a threat multiplier. So why don't you spoil our day and give us the worst case scenario for climate change if we don't get our hands yeah, around the I mean, I, 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 we've talked about this and, and, uh, and I, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because I hadn't been posed that specific part of it before. And, but I will give you a worst case scenario. Arctic cap melts. Let's say in 15 to 20 years, you have a huge sea level rise. I'm not talking six inches or a foot talking three, four, maybe five feet. As a consequence, all your East Coast cities have huge flooding problems. Miami, New York, Boston, Baltimore, Norfolk. Our bases and stations around the world that are one, two, three feet above sea level all go underwater. You've, they've all got to move. So you've got to relocate all your bases and stations. And now that's the immediate impact, I call that tactically here in the United States. Strategic implications, Bangladesh ends up Initially, with a five million dollar, five million person refugee problem, but it expands to 15 to 30 million people have to go somewhere, and there's not the room, there's not the space in Bangladesh. Can't go to India because it's an armed border. Can't go to Myanmar. Where do they go? You talk about a refugee problem of almost unimaginable uh, proportion here. And of course, we look at what we've got with one or two million or three million. Not that that's insignificant out of Syria. Mm -hmm. But this would be a problem that's even considerably worse, and it floods itself throughout Southeast Asia. So you have uprisings there. You've got armed conflict going on there. We're asked to respond. In the middle of this, um, much like Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, instead of having 200 or 250 mile an hour typhoons, you get 300. Just blow away total countries or total cities. And the principal responder is us. And he here's another flip to that issue. It happens to come at a time when the Chinese are building, building islands in the South China Sea and the Philippines uh, feel very threatened by this, as they should. And of course, the Chinese are trying to assert territorial claim to those waters through the Law of the Sea Convention, which, by the way, we do not sign up to. Uh, so all this starts to, starts to gel itself into huge conflict throughout the world and, and, uh, and food shortages uh, beyond compare. Now, that's, that's Armageddon. That's the worst case. I don't think it's going to happen. So what do we need to do to prevent that scenario? Yeah, I mean, I, we get that question in the American Security Project. And one of the points to having a number of senior flag officers on our board, and don't, don't misunderstand me, we've got uh, a number of very distinguished American politicians and businessmen and women on the board. Uh, Lockheed Martin, Norm Augustine, uh, former CEO, is on the board. Uh, Christine Todd Whitman, former governor of New Jersey and also former administrator of the EPA is our chairwoman right now. And uh, so we've got a nice mix. But the military guys there are there to say, hey, the ultimate solution is not the military. You know, as we talk about Syria and you talk, listen to the candidates, I'm going to send 25,000 troops. I'm going to have a safe zone. It's not the answer there. The answer there is to fix the political situation. Now, for climate change long term, the answer to it is you've got to get rid of CO2 pollution. And I mean, that sounds simplistic, uh, but it's true. I mean, it really is true. And COP21, the Conference of Parties 21 in Paris, uh, we'll have some really good results from it. Who knows whether we'll accept those. We didn't from Kyoto, as you might uh, know. Uh, but and, and we are an all-above organization at ASP, whether it's cap and trade, uh, tax, a carbon tax, uh, whether there are incentives for renewables, whether there are alternative energies, not just solar, not just wind, uh, investment in innovation, fusion energy, for instance, is one option. Working with nuclear energy uh, industry and having them tailor their reactors, making them cheaper, making them more efficient, making them better. Uh, those are all options that we support to get rid of CO2 pollution. 
So other than climate change, other than political violence, what are some of the security problems, challenges for the United States? Oh boy, um, public diplomacy is a huge one. We feel at ASP that our country doesn't do that particularly well, haven't put enough emphasis on it. Cybersecurity is, uh, obviously, that is another one. When I, my own personal data got hacked with the OPM breach, um, and I know dozens, dozens who got, who got hacked. We've got to stop and prevent that, and we've got smart enough people, not necessarily in the government, there are smart people there too, but the industry folks, they're all there. We need to tap into that uh, intelligence that's there, those folks, the innovation that can fix the cybersecurity problem, because we're all so dependent on all that data that, that can be hacked and has been hacked, so cyber is probably one of the, the biggest. So what do we do about that kind of challenge? We're so dependent on technology. Sure. And, and it seems to be our strength and our weakness. Well, it is. And, uh, you know, we're the ones who discovered it, put it all together, and now, they're, now and of course, it's exploded worldwide, and there are brilliant minds all over the world that are working pro and con on the cyber question, uh, as they have here. I, I think you just have to put the resources against it and understand it. Now, that that gets into the policy and legal side of the house too, i.e. NSA monitoring your phones, collection of data, how much does this government take, Privacy Act, uh, and there's there's a balance to this. I mean, it is, it is, and it's a tough one. It's a tough one to answer. Um, I know a lot of Americans don't care to have their phone conversations recorded. I, I understand that, but if it means the security of your life or your finances, I think you wouldn't mind somebody at least keeping track of it. Uh, in terms of who's hacking you and how it's getting hacked and, and what kind of screens you can put up or prevention, preventive devices to stop the hacking from occurring. And the other side of the two is work in the international community. I mean, this is a hand in glove operation. The, the financial community is totally dependent on electronics and cyber. I mean, it's, it's a world, you can make a trade. If you're in Hong Kong, you can do a trade right now mm -hmm. on, on Wall Street, in, literally in milliseconds. It's that kind of thing that, that's dangerous, it's great, but it's dangerous, ought to be regulated, we have to keep an eye on it. As, as you deal with these global challenges, what is the relative role of the United States? You, you have some analysts saying the United States is a declining superpower. Yeah. You have some pundits who go to the extreme and say the United States will no longer be relevant uh, a decade or two from now. But in, in my opinion and in my experience, the United States seems to sort of review and renew itself periodically and, and usually comes back better than before, at least in terms of dealing with the challenges. So where are, are we a declining superpower? Are we declining and, um, and also climbing relative to other countries as they sure. climb and decline? You know, John, I, I, I take offense is not the right word. I, I abhor the the relative term superpower or declining or, or being the greatest, uh, it, it kind of gives you the opinion that we're, we're superior, we're better than you. Mm -hmm. and, and then that's not the case. We want to live our lives the way we can live our lives. We, and we want to do it in a peaceful way, uh, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. And we, and we do a good job with that. The fact of the matter is, our former government works and it works well. Uh, it's proven that our industry succeeds because of it, and there, there are some problems with our tax structure, which I won't get into that unless you ask me. But my, my point to it is it's not a case of, and I'll, I'll take nuclear weapons as an example, oh, we've got more nuclear weapons than you and we're more powerful. We don't, personally, I think we really don't want nuclear weapons, and we, we do need them to a point to balance as a counterforce to those who have them, but, but I hate to get into the number counting business, okay, we gotta have 1,551 because you have 1,550, and, and I don't like those measurements. I think to get to the bottom line of your question here, we will always be at the forefront of science and innovation and technology because of our university system, like the University of Central Florida, uh, we've got innovation, we study, we open society, we're, we're, we will continue to push those limits. Whereas that capability doesn't exist anywhere else like it does here. And until somebody comes up with a system similar to ours and maybe, maybe better, I don't know what that would be, they're not gonna be as good as us. On the military side of the house, and hands down, I have 30 plus years in the Marines, we've got a fantastic military establishment. It's unmatched, in my personal opinion. The, uh, and I've seen almost all the other ones in the world. 
they, they just can't do it the way. We put a huge investment, and I would know, into the training aspect of our troops. To train an NCO, NCO is a corporal or a sergeant or above, um, it really takes three or four years, maybe five years, mm -hmm. years. And you've got to have total control of that individual 24 7. And of course, they're all pointing to our failure to train troops in Iraq, which we've had, what, a year or maybe a year and a half or two. And then you have to have a volunteer, control of them. He's got to be outfitted. It's not an easy thing to do. Nobody's going to come close to us, John. Mm. What about the rising powers? You've mentioned China several times. We've seen Russia resurgent sure. of late, uh, projecting force into Syria. Uh, are those real threats, or oh. is it just the give and take of the international system? There are always threats of some sort or another. They're all going to protect their national interest, particularly in the case of China, with the building of the Spratleys and wanting to take over the territorial waters. Um, I mean, that is that's a challenge. and. I did not like the word pivot to Asia. Asia. I, you know, I just, I, because it insinuates that we're taking from somewhere else and we're putting it there, so those in the Middle East or those in Europe or those in South America go, hey, what about us? Uh, however, that said, China is very important. And of course, the big, one of the biggest threats there is North Korea. It's not China, but um, militarily, we could take them out in a nanosecond, but if they launched a nuke at somebody, it would be hell to pay. Russia. Um, Russia's huge problem. They're rearming part of the Arctic. Uh, that, that, to me, is a, an alarm bell. And, uh, we really have to keep, we have to work with them and keep an eye on them, but I'm, ultimately I'm not sure what his aim is other than he wants to be the player on the international mm -hmm. scene and wants to challenge, and I think we ought to recognize him. Sure, you're, you're a major country. Uh, you're part of the Security Council. This, you, you are. What more do you want? Well, maybe he wants uh, the Warsaw Pact back, uh, all those countries. So uh, I think that, indeed, and it's when you bring in the nuclear side of this, and they have nuclear weapons, and they've kind of rattled that a little bit lately, that is really problematic. I mean, it's not, not that we don't have the capability to counter that. We do, clearly. But you certainly don't want to introduce that into any kind of a conflict. And, and uh, I think you've always got to have that in the back of your mind. So ultimately, some would say nuclear weapons are the ultimate threat even more than climate change. And I think mm, perhaps they are if somebody got a hold of them or mm -hmm. they exported the technology to a terrorist organization, then it would really be bad news. But the rattling of such weapons implies you're willing to use them. And I, that's, that's what. Disturbs me. Uh, it disturbs me too, and, and I, uh, I'm on a number of study groups uh, and boards. One big board at the State Department that works for the Undersecretary for Nonproliferation, and we discuss this issue a lot. And uh, and you wax and wane on it. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, under New Start out of 2011, we go down to 1,550 weapons, or, and we're getting there pretty fast. That's such an immense amount of nuclear capability. I mean, how many do you need to counter wh whoever has whatever? I mean, you really don't even want to use one. I mean, you, it's almost inconceivable to me w that we would ever even use one, to be honest with you. I, I understand it, but I just don't see us ever doing it. Now, Putin, I just don't know. And there was a time in the mid -night, late 90s, early 2000s, where the Russian uh, Traditional forces had lost their potency. They had really uh, deteriorated significantly. And one of the thoughts was that they would use their nuclear arsenal because their traditional forces, conventional forces, w were weak. And they would back it up with nuclear weapons. Now that is big trouble. But now Putin has built up the conventional and is working hard to build up his conventional forces back to where they were early 80s, late 70s. Um, is that a good thing? <laughs> I'm not sure, but we'd rather not have him using nuclear weapons. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, General Cheney. John, it's been my pleasure, and uh, thank you and the University of Central Florida. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.